Now, I wanted to speak today about obeying the grammar that God has put out in his word. Uh, if you turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew 5, verse 18, when God took the time to write his word, inspired by God's Holy Spirit, he took time to make sure every word, even to the extent of the strokes and the smallest letters, would be correct. And, in, and read with me Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Every little detail will be accomplished. In some translation, it says, uh, instead of smallest letter and stroke, it says your periods and commas, even the periods and commas that the Lord has placed in his word are there for a specific purpose. And so, here in these two sentences, you can tell me which one you think is correct and which one you think is wrong. The difference one comma can make in a sentence, I think some of you already know. First sentence, it says, like when somebody invites me to a dinner, and they put the food out there, and then they say, shall we start eating a J? They have a comma there in between, shall we start eating, and then comma, a J. And that's telling me, are we ready to eat? And they're asking me, and I say, yes, we're ready to eat. The second sentence, shall we start eating a J? That means, shall we start eating me? And so just that one little comma makes a big difference. And so in, in English, that's not a, such a, a serious thing. But when we take God's word, every single period and comma is serious. We want to make sure if God put a period there, that we put a period there as well. Probably one of the wonder, most wonderful verses in the Bible. It says here in Malachi 1, 1 verse uh, Verse 2, and turn with me, if you have your Bibles, Malachi chapter 1, verse 2. It says, I have loved you, says the Lord, and what's, what's, what comes after that? A period. I have loved you, says the Lord, period. And I see that when God has said his word, do not eat from this tree, what does the devil immediately come and say? Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed has God said, You shall not surely eat. You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. Indeed has God said. God said something and he put a period there. And the devil says, did God indeed say that? And sometimes it's the devil who says that. And here, if you turn back to Malachi, when God said, I have loved you, what does man reply? But you say, how have you loved us? God put a period there and says, I have loved you. And then, but you say, How have you loved me? And as you see, the the devil also does not want to take God's word seriously. And sometimes we also don't want to take what God said seriously. After God left heaven, came here to earth, suffered, was mocked, was mistreated, scourged, went to the cross, died, And he says, I love you. And then you ask this question, how have you loved us? After God showed me all his love on the cross, and then I say, how have you loved me? That's saying, God, I saw that period there, but I think it should be a comma there, Lord. 
I say, no, Lord, you've done enough to show me that you love me. And if you said you love me, I believe it. That song we sang, the cup of wrath which was reserved for me, it was going to come to me. It had my name on it and said, Ajay, this is your cup. You need to drink it. And Jesus said, no, I'll drink it for it. I'll drink it for him. And when God loved me so much, I want to take his word as it is. And it says here in Habakkuk, in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1, it talks about two people. It says in Habakkuk 2, 1, verse, I'm sorry, Habakkuk 2, 4, Habakkuk 2, 4. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. So when God says something in his word, if I believe it, I'm humble. If I don't believe it, what am I saying? I'm proud. That's what it says here. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. In contrast, the righteous will live by his faith. So there's proud people, they hear God's word and they don't believe it. A humble person, what will he do? When God says, I, love, I have loved you, period. I say, you know what, Lord, I believe it. One proof of my humility is when God says something, I'm humble enough to obey it and believe it. And if I need to understand how much God has loved me, it says there in John chapter 17, verse 23. John chapter 17, verse 23. And it's good to look at it in our Bibles I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, loved his disciples. The them represents the disciples that it talks about in verse 6, those whom the Father has given me. The disciples. God has and loved them even as you have loved me. To the same extent that the Father loved Jesus, he loves me. And it says there, and there's a period there, even as you have loved me, period. And I say, Lord, where you put a period, I want to also stop, Lord. I'm a disciple of yours today, just like they were. And just like you loved those disciples, as much as you loved Jesus, when Jesus was born, Heaven's eyes were upon Jesus. When Herod tried to kill him, even as a baby, the father didn't sit still and, and just allow Herod to do what he wanted. No, he asked Joseph to take Jesus to Egypt to protect his son. And throughout the years, every time someone tried to harm Jesus, they couldn't do anything because the father's eyes were upon him. And for you and me, it's the same way today. If we believe it, if we put a period where God has put a period and says, yes, he has loved me. He has loved me as much as he's loved Jesus. If you turn with me to Mark chapter 2, verse 5. Mark chapter 2. They bring a, four men bring a man in a stretcher. They put a they put a hole in the ceiling and they drop him down. And this is what Jesus says in verse 5. Mark chapter 2, verse 5. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Period. He said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Period. And in the Parallel passage in Matthew chapter 9, verse 2. It says, be of good cheer, or take courage. Son, your sins are forgiven. And I say, Lord, I want to take your word as. You said it's forgiven, period. Then I say, it's forgiven, Lord. It says there in First, first John 1, 9. Turn with me to First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous, to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, period. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Today, have you confessed your sins before 
told God everything. You're not one who's covered up the sins. You're not hiding your sins. You said, Lord, these are the sins I've done. I confess it before you. I'm sorry for what I've done. I repent of it. I want to forsake it. What will God do? He'll forgive it. Do you believe God's word today when he says he's forgiven it? Her sins, though they are many. Turn with me to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Her sins, though many. Verse 47. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Our sins may be many today, but we can believe just like she did. Her sins were many, but she was forgiven that day, all her sins. Today, do you have, brother, sister, young person, do you have many sins? They can be forgiven today if you believe. Have you forgiven everybody who's harmed you? If there's one more person that you haven't yet gone and asked for forgiveness, are you willing to go and ask them for forgiveness today? The Father said, if you don't forgive others, I will not forgive you. The Father in heaven will not forgive you. And so I say, forgive others. And if you've hurt someone, go and ask them for forgiveness. So that this promise, forgiven, and it goes on to say, and remembers your sin no more. Turn with me to Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8, <clears throat> verse 12. Hebrews 8, verse 12. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. There's a verse in Matthew, I'm sorry, Micah, I'm sorry, not Matthew, Micah, Micah chapter 7, Micah chapter 7, Micah chapter 7, it says, he will again have compassion on us, Micah 7, 19, Micah 7, 19, he will again have compassion on us, he will tread on our iniquities underfoot, yes, you will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. I will remember your sins no more. I'll cast them to the depths of the sea. Do you know how many people have climbed Mount Everest? It's above, uh, um, more than 6,000 people actually have climbed to the highest point on the earth, which is Mount Everest. More than 6,000 people have climbed there. Do you know how many people have walked on the moon? 12 people have walked on the moon. Do you know how many people have walked at the lowest point, the lowest depths of the sea? It's called Mariana, uh, Mariana Trent, and it's about more than six miles deep. And only three people have actually gone in a vehicle down there, ever. But nobody has walked down there. The pressure is too high. But I say, Lord, you put my sins in the depths of the sea. You remember my sins no more, period. Where God puts a period, I also put a period. I believe it. What God says is true. Jesus quoted God's scripture, quoted, quoted God's word. He didn't modify it. And if it was good for Jesus to quote, as is, it's good for me to quote as well. Believe it as is. He cares for me, period. Turn with me to First Peter. First Peter, chapter 5, verse 5, talking again about humility. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. First Peter 5, 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt you at the proper time, 
comma, verse 7, casting all your anxiety on him or your cares upon him because he cares for you, period. So it says there, therefore humble yourselves. How should I humble myself? Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you at the proper time, comma, casting all your anxiety on him. Many of us seek to be humble. Many of us want to be humble because we know that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. One way I see that I can be a humble person is say, Lord, this thing is too much. I can't, this care for me, this anxiety for me is too much for me. But I'm going to give it to you. Here's this care that I have, this care that is bothering me. Something's bothering me. Lord, I'm anxious about this situation. I give it to you. Why? Because I believe that you care for me, period. If you turn with me to Mark chapter 4. If you're in a storm and your boat is sinking, water is filling up, what would your cry be? The boat is, the boat is there and the, wind, the winds and the waves are there and you're in that boat and it's, it's going, it's, it's, it's shaking and wind is there, water is filling up and you're there. Jesus is there, he's lying on, on a cushion in the back. What would you do? You go wake him up. What's your, what's your, what's your cry going to be? Help me, save me. I would, if I knew that something drastic was happening, something serious was happening, the first cry would be, save me, help me. Verse 36, Matthew 4, 20, 36. Leaving the crowd, they took along them in a boat, just as he was, and other boats were th- there with him. Verse 37, 37. And there arose a fierce gale in, of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. 38. Jesus himself was in the sterns, asleep in the, on the cushions, and they woke him up and said to him, They didn't say, please save me. What did they say? Teacher, do you not care? Do you not care that we are perishing? Yes, we're perishing, but the main complaint they had was, do you not care that we're perishing? We're going through this big storm. The boat is sinking, and do you not care? And Jesus said, verse uh, verse 39, and he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. Verse 40, and he said to them, why are you afraid? Because we didn't care, that we didn't know that you cared for us. That's why we were afraid. Do you still have no faith? What type of faith? The faith that God cared for them. Do you not care that we are perishing? Did Jesus care? Yes. He cares for me, period. Each of us go through difficult situations in our lives, in our home, in the church, in the workplace. We go through difficult times. And through all these storms of life, we have to have one anchor, that God cares for me, period. Sometimes it might be a fierce storm, but other times it might be not so fierce. Turn with me to Luke chapter 10. Verse 38, Martha welcomed Jesus into their home and the disciples into their home. Luke 10, 39, she had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. Verse 40, but Martha was distracted with all her preparations and came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care? It was not more about what Mary was doing, but the first thing that she asked us, Lord, do you not care? I'm going through something here in the kitchen. 
My sister's not helping. And Jesus, do you not care about the situation that I'm going through? And she said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left all to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But Jesus answered and said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered or anxious about many things. Why? Why? Because she did not cast all her care upon the Lord because God cares for her, period. So sometimes it's the big things in life when the boat's sinking in the storm, or sometimes it could be somebody's not helping me in the kitchen. Somebody's not helping me at work. Somebody's, my relative is not helping me. Somebody at the church didn't help me. Might be a small care. But does Jesus care about the small cares of my life? Yes. And if I'm a humble person, I'll say, Lord, the small thing in my life that's bothering me right now, I want to tell you, Lord, Because even for the big problems in life and the small problems of life, you care about it, period. And so this morning, when God puts a period somewhere in in his word, let's not change it to a comma. And when God puts a comma and says, casting all our cares upon you, for he cares for you, period. Keep the commas where they are and the periods where they are. So, God loves me, period. He has forgiven me and remembers, no my, no more, remembers my sins no more, period. And he cares for me, period. May the Lord help us. Amen.